Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast, this podcast called The Dictionary. Thank you for joining me. And, uh, oh, you know, I missed some extremely important holidays that I forgot to tell you about a few days ago. Uh, Let's see. Saturday, February 15th was Susan B. Anthony's birthday, and they only observed that in California, Florida, New York, and Wisconsin. Uh, She was important, right? Didn't she get the uh, women's right to vote happening and probably some other important things? Uh, let's see, in Alaska on February 16th, it was Elizabeth Perotrovich's, per- Perotrovich Day. So I hope you had a very good Elizabeth Perotrovich Day on Sunday. Uh, on the 17th was President's Day. Uh, interesting, there are some, it's a federal holiday, but there are some states that don't celebrate President's Day. Why? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 states don't celebrate it. Do you just don't believe in presidents? Or do you not believe that people should have a day off on President's Day? I don't get President's Day off. Um, also on February 17th in Arkansas, it was Daisy Gatson, Gatson Bates Day. And that's enough for now. Let's talk about, oh, hey, dictionary, you screwed something up. Um, the top of page 96 says the first word is, you know, in the very top where it says the first and last word on that page. Uh it says the first word is bandied, B-A-N-D-I-E-D, uh, but it's not. Bandied isn't even in the book. So what happened there? Uh, the first actual word is bandit, B-A-N-D-I-T. Uh, so I don't know what you did to make that happen, but somebody screwed up. Uh, all right, so bandit is a noun from 1611, number one. Uh, the plural form is banditi, and it means an outlaw who lives by plunder, especially a member of a band of marauders. The masked marauder. I feel like that's from a Warner Brothers cartoon. The masked marauder. Uh, number two, we have the synonym robber. Number three, an enemy plane. Like a plane. That was weird. Uh, This is Italian from bandito, from the verb bandire, which means to banish. So maybe uh, when somebody was bad, they were banished from the old town, and uh, that's why they called them a bandito. Uh, It is of Germanic origin, akin to the old high German banan, which means to command, and there's more at the word ban. Uh, ban- banditry is a noun. Like when you are a bandit, you are committing banditry. Something like that. All right, next we have bandito. It is a noun from 1591, an outlaw, especially of Mexican extraction or origin. Uh, even though it's an Italian word, they still call them banditos in Mexico. Next we have band leader. Who is your favorite band leader? Uh, the only the first one I can think of is, uh, what was his name? Oscar something, or was his last name Oscar? He played the piano. He was from many decades ago. I, this is a noun from 1894, the conductor of a band as a dance band. Next we have band, oh, I, wow, this almost didn't come out right, band master. I don't know why that's so hard to say. Uh, this is a noun from 1858. We have the synonym band leader, especially a conductor of a military or concert band. I don't know why they just call them a band leader, uh, but they call them a band master. Next, we have band mate. This is a noun from 1956, a fellow member of a band. Next is band dog, B-A-N-D-O-G. It is one word. It's a noun from the 14th century. A dog kept tied to serve as a watchdog or because of its ferocity. Uh, This is Middle English, uh, bandog, D-O-G-G-E, from band plus dog, D-O-G-G-E, which means dog. Uh, So, uh, you know, back in the olden days when dogs were still relatively new to people, um, they wouldn't let them in their house maybe or as often Uh, or depending on, you know, its ferocity. Uh, This actually reminds me of the Pixar short. I can't remember if I mentioned this before. Uh, It is called Kit Bull, and it is about a cat and a pit bull, 
and uh, it was actually nominated for an Oscar. Oh, you know what? I think it won. Did it win? No, maybe not. I can't remember. No, it didn't. Actually, the other one, the one that did win for Best Animated Short also deserved to win, and I think I saw that a long time ago, uh, and I'm pretty sure I cried at that one, and I definitely cried at Kitbull, and I am not ashamed to admit that because, dang, they really pull at your heartstrings. Anyway, in Kit Bull, they have a dog chained up outside, and it sucks. Uh, next, we have Bandolier. This is a noun from circa 1577. A belt worn over the shoulder and across the breast, often for the suspending or supporting of some article, as cartridges, or as a part of an official or ceremonial dress. I've heard of bandolier. I think I would have assumed it was a, a, a weapon of some kind, uh, but I don't know those things, so I didn't know. Um, but now I know. This is uh, from Middle French bandoliere, uh, which is ultimately from the Old Spanish bando, which means band. It is of Germanic origin akin to the Gothic banduo, and there's more at the word banner. We have been seeing a lot of a similar etymology recently. Next, we have Bandor, or it could also be Bandora. Uh, this is a noun from 1566, a bass stringed instrument resembling a guitar. So would you just call it a bass? Nope, it is a bass stringed instrument resembling a guitar. I will have to find a picture of this. It is Spanish from Banduria or Portuguese bandura, from Latin pandura, with a P, which is a three-stringed lute, and from the Greek uh, pandura, spelled a little bit differently. Next, we have band pass filter. So there's a hyphen in band pass, and then filter is its own word. This is a noun from 1926, a filter that transmits only frequencies within a selected band. Uh, so this is when you're dealing with audio filters and compression and editing and such. Uh, so I, when I'm editing this uh, episode, and by editing I mean listening through and making sure everything is good, and that I, uh, you know, any links that I have to find, I'm listening for them there. Um, so I can add different kinds of band pass filters uh, in my editing. Uh, so I could say the phrase, hello, my name is Spencer. That has no bandpass filter. And then I could add another one with the same phrase, which I will just edit in here. Hello, my name is Spencer. And then maybe I can add a different one and it will sound a little bit differently. Hello, my name is Spencer. Audio is so interesting. All right, next we have band saw, two words. It is a noun from 1858. A saw in the form of an endless steel belt running over pulleys. Also, a power saw using this device usually with the blade in a vertical position. Uh, so I think this is the one isn't where it's like a table and then the... Then the uh, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to move on to band shell. Two words. It is a noun from 1926. A bandstand having at the rear a sounding board shaped like a huge concave seashell. And I think some of them are actually uh, sort of um, carved or designed to actually look like a seashell. Uh, this is so the sound will bounce up and then out towards the audience so they have uh, better acoustics. Uh, next we have bandsman, all one word, noun from circa 1842, a member of a musical band. And then somebody else in that band would be a band mate. And they would play in the next word, bandstand, and it might have a band shell behind them. And then if they robbed and pillage the town that they were in, they would become banditos or bandits. All right, bandstand is next. It is a noun from 1859. One, a usually roofed platform on which a band or orchestra performs outdoors. Number two, a platform in a ballroom or nightclub on which musicians perform. Next is B and W. So that's the letter B and the letter W with the word and in the middle. This is an abbreviation for black and white. Uh, I do a bit of photography and I... Uh, 
I, I don't really do it a lot, or it sort of comes and goes in waves. Uh, I haven't done it for a while, but I really like the idea of black and white photography. Um, I think it sort of... Um, it sort of limits you, and so you can sort of focus a bit more on light and composition, and uh, you can have some fun with your post-processing if you do any of that. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like black and white photography, and I want to do more of it. When will I find the time? Maybe if I stop doing this podcast, I would have more time for it. But that's not going to happen, because I like reading this book. Next, we have Band Wagon. It is a noun from 1855. One a usually ornate and high wagon for a band of musicians, especially in a circus parade. Number two, a popular party, faction, or cause that attracts growing support, often used in such phrases as jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, that happens. Number three, a current or fashionable trend. Next and last word for this episode is bandwidth. It is all one word, B-A-N-D-W-I-D-T-H. It is a noun from 1930. One, a range within a band of wavelengths, frequencies, or energies, especially a range of radio frequencies which is occupied by a modulated carrier wave which is assigned to a service or over which a device can operate. Number two equally lengthy, almost. The capacity for data transfer of an electronic communication system, as in, graphics consume more bandwidth than text does, especially the maximum data transfer rate of such a system, as in, a bandwidth of 56 kilobits per second. Oh, do I remember the days of dial-up modems. 56K was, like, the fastest uh, modem you could find at the time. And you were super cool if you had one of those. Wow, you kids today, you have no idea what you avoided. Uh, So, what is the word of the episode? Uh, Let's see. I'm going to pick band pass filter. Let's try one more band pass filter uh, with the phrase, Thank you very much. And until... What? Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. How are you doing today? I hope you are just wonderful and dandy. And that rhymes with the first word of this episode, bandy. B-A-N-D-Y. This is the first form. It is a verb from 1577. Uh, We are going to start with the transitive definitions. One, to bat as a tennis ball, to and fro. 2a, to toss from side to side or pass about from one to another, often in a careless or inappropriate manner. Oh, look at us. We are so careless and inappropriate, bandying this ball from one to another. 1, uh, no, 2b, we have the synonym exchange, especially to exchange words argumentatively. Bandying about. 2c, to discuss lightly or banteringly. Banter. Like, you know, you talk with somebody, you have banter. Uh, so, to discuss lightly or banteringly. In a bantering way. 2D. To use in a glib or offhand manner. Often used with the word about. As in, bandy these statistics about with considerable bravada. No, bravado. That is a quote from Richard uh, Well. How do you pronounce it? Is it Polak or Pollock or Polak? I don't know. I'll see if I can find where that quote is from. Uh, the, uh, ever since I said that I was going to start trying to find where these quotes are from, um, I found maybe half of them. Uh, so, you know, I might not find it, uh, but I also don't spend that much time researching it. Number three is archaic, and it means to band together. Now we have a couple intransitive definitions. One, Uh, This is obsolete. The synonym is contend. And number two is archaic. We have the synonym unite. Uh, Next we have bandy again. This is the second form. It is a noun from 1693. Uh, By the way, the etymology is unknown. 
Uh, it is a game similar to hockey and believed to be its prototype. Oh, well, now we should see if we can find an example of this. Uh, I don't know if they had videos back in 1693... Um, to post on YouTube, but I'll see if I can find an example of some people playing bandy. All right, now we have the third form of bandy. It is an adjective from 1687. One is talking about legs. We have the synonym bowed. So if you've got bowed legs, uh, you would be bandy, I guess. Uh, number two synonym is bow-legged. And uh, bandy-legged is uh, another form form, another word, that's an adjective as well. Uh, this is perhaps from the number two form of bandy, uh, which is hockey stick. So, you know, the hockey stick is bent. Uh, somebody was like, hey, your hockey stick, your legs look like a hockey stick. So I'm going to call you bandy. That's weird. All right, next we have bane. It is the first form. It is a noun from before the 12th century. 1A is obsolete, and we have the synonyms killer and slayer. 1B, we have the synonym poison. 1C, synonyms are death and destruction. This is a fun word. Uh, as in, stop the way of those that seek my bane. That is a quote from Philip Sidney. Uh, let's see, 1D, we have the synonym woe, as in woe is me. Not woe, stop the horse. Number two, a source of harm or ruin. Synonym is curse. As in, national frontiers have been more of a bane than a boon for mankind. And that is a quote from D.C. Thompson. Boy, I'm going to have a lot of quotes to look up, aren't I? Uh, I wonder if bane and boon are related uh, because they're both used in this, like they're opposites maybe. And I wonder if there's a reason uh, that they sound similar. Uh, but maybe we'll find out when we get to Boone. But we can read you some etymology for this one. It is Middle English from Old English, Bana, which is akin to Old High German, Bano, B-A-N-O, which means death. Uh, all right, next we have the second form of Bane. It is a verb from 1598. It is obsolete, and it means to kill, especially with poison. Uh, you know that. Poison will do you in. Now we have the third form of bane. It is a noun from before the 12th century. It is chiefly Scottish, and it uh, we have the synonym bone, like the bone in your arm or your brain or your foot. Uh, I'm going to skip the etymology. Next we have baneberry. Uh, yeah, it's all one word. It's like a strawberry, but instead of a straw, they're using a bane. It is a noun from 1755, any of several perennial herbs of the buttercup family having acrid poisonous berries, also one of the berries. Well, I can see where they got the name from because if the berries are acrid and poisonous, uh, that is relating directly to the first form of bane, which is all about killing and slaying and poison. So maybe they use these berries to kill people. Uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, let's see, the uh, d d d d d the genus name is Octaea, A-C-T-A-E-A. -A. So I'll post a picture of these, and then if you see them, you should not eat them. And you should also not give them to anybody else. All right, next we have baneful. It is an adjective from 1579. One, productive of destruction or woe, seriously harmful, as in, a baneful influence. Number two is archaic, and we have the synonym poisonous. Uh, then it says synonym, see the word pernicious. Ooh, uh, was that in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? The No, wait, that was a different word. That was the vicious knids. What is that from? Why, why is that in my brain? Vicious knids, something like that. Pernicious, I don't think that's what it was, but it's a good word. Banefully is an adverb. Next we have bang, B-A-N-G. It is a verb from uh, circa 1550. Transitive definitions are first. One, to strike sharply. Synonym is bump, as in banged his knee. Uh, number two, to knock, hit, or thrust vigorously, often with a sharp noise, as in banged the door shut. Just this morning, 
I went, I took the garbage out and our screen door for some reason, you know, how they're supposed to like close slowly, it didn't cl- close slowly. And so when I went out, it banged shut. And then when I came back in, it banged shut again. And my wife was like, what was that noise? And I said, the screen door is stupid. Uh, all right, number three, often vulgar, to have sexual intercourse with. Uh, yep, people say that. Uh, all right, now I don't have anything clever to say about that because this is a family-friendly podcast. Uh, now we have the intransitive definitions. One, to strike with a sharp noise or thump. Number two, to produce a sharp, often metallic, explosive, or percussive noise or series of such noises. Number three, to play a sport, as basketball, in a very aggressive and forceful manner, as in bang for rebounds. Now, I don't really watch a lot of sports uh, these days, but I have not really heard them use this word in this form. Uh, Just this morning, I was listening to the How Did This Get Made episode uh, of Space Jam, and they had a whole conversation They had a whole conversation about the word jam and how and why is it related to basketball. And uh, that reminded me of that. Uh, Maybe there should be a bang jam game? I don't know. Uh, Let's see. This is probably of Scandinavian origin, akin to the Old Norse bang, B-A-N-G, again, uh, which means hammering. Now we have the second form of bang. It is a noun from circa 1550, one a resounding blow. Number two, a sudden loud noise, used often interjectionally. 3A, a sudden striking effect. 3B, a quick burst of energy, as in, start off with a bang. Uh, that's probably from races. They would, uh, they would shoot a gun or make a big loud bang, uh, so they knew when to go. Number uh, 3C, synonym is thrill, as in, I get a bang out of all this. That is a quote from W.H. White, and White is spelled W-H-Y-T-E. Wouldn't that be great if his middle name was Ite, spelled Y-T-E, and then he'd be W-H Ite White, and it would be spelled that way? Okay, now we have a phrase, bang for the du- no, bang for the buck, also bang for one's buck. And that means value received from outlay or effort. As in, investment is yielding less bang for the buck. Let me try that again. Investment is yielding less bang for the buck. That is a quote from Fortune Magazine or Fortune something. Um, let's see. Excuse me. Uh, now we have the third form of bang. It is an adverb from 1828. And we have these synonyms right and directly. As in, Rang, no, ran bang up against more trouble. Ran bang up against more trouble? Weird. Funky word. All right, now we have the fourth form of bang. It is a noun from 1878. A fringe of banged hair, usually used in plural, like bangs. This is probably short for bang tail, which is a short tail. Uh, And I'm going to look ahead and see if bang tail is in this book. Uh, let's see. Bang, uh, bang, bang. Yeah, it is. Um, but that is not what that says. Okay, that's interesting. Um, they Might Be Giants have a song called Bangs, and it's... it's uh, Maybe I'll put a clip in. Bangs above your eyes you hear hangs. So I'm still curious as to where... why they used a bang tail... Um, for, I don't know, maybe just because it's uh, something that, well, it says short tail, so maybe it's something that's cut short, and the hair in, on your uh, forehead is cut short, and um, that's where they got that from. Uh, and yeah, it says fringe in the UK and probably other places. Instead of saying bangs, they say they, they have fringe, uh, which actually makes more sense. Um, all right, now we have the fifth and final form of bang. It is a transitive verb from 1878. And it means to cut, as front hair, short and squarely across. So very much... Oh, so that's the verb form of uh, what we just read. But I've never heard it used in a verb form. I'm going to... You're going to bang your hair? I mean, you say, you say I'm going to get bangs, or I'm going to make... Have bangs, something like that. I've never heard it 
in a verb form. Uh, so that's that one. Next, we have Bangalore Torpedo. Uh, this is two words. Bangalore is B-A-N-G-A-L-O-R-E. Uh, this is a noun from 1913, a metal tube that contains explosives and a firing mechanism and is used to cut barbed wire and detonate buried mines. Uh, it doesn't say super specifically where this came from. All it says is that it is from the city or town Bangalore, India, uh, which I have actually been to. I visited there for work. I uh, had to go shoot some video interviews, uh, and so some of the people were in Bangalore, India. Um, but yeah, I still don't... M maybe this torpedo was designed in Bangalore, and that's why they call it a Bangalore torpedo. They should have called it a Bangalorepedo. Bangatorpedo, something. Next, we have bang away. It is two words. It is a... Tra uh, no, intransitive verb from 1839. One, to work with determined effort. As in, students banging away at their homework. Number two, to attack persistently. As in, police are going to keep banging away at you. That is a quote from Earl Stanley Gardner. And Earl is spelled E-R-L-E. I don't think I've seen that name spelled that way. Unless it's a typo. Now we have bang bang. There's a hyphen. It is an adjective from 1972. 1A, having a sudden forceful or attention-grabbing effect. Synonym is punchy, as in bang-bang headlines. Does this still get used? I don't think so. 1B, executed or happening so quickly as to make judgment, as by an umpire or referee. Bang-bang. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't finish that one. Uh, let's try it again. 1B, executed or happening so quickly as to make judgment difficult. Uh, and then in parentheses, of course, it said, as by an umpire or referee, as in a bang-bang play at first base. Number two, characterized by violent or fast-paced action, as in a bang-bang movie. Again, do people really say that? Uh, all right, last word for this episode is banger, B-A-N-G-E-R. It is a noun from circa 1919, one is British, and we have the synonym sausage. Have you heard of um, bangers? Well, see, now I'm thinking of the restaurant bar near us called Bangers and Lace. Uh, but there's bangers. Yeah, that's just another word for sausage. What's the dish? Uh, ba ba there's some British dish. It's like something in bangers or bangers and something. Anyway, my brain isn't working. That's sausage. Uh, now, number two, also British, we have the synonym firecracker. And then there's another one. Number three is also British, and we have the synonym jalopy. So you really need to pay attention to the context because you need to know if they're talking about a sausage or a firecracker or a jalopy. Uh, but you could say, I drove my banger to pick up some bangers, and on the way, I ate some bangers at a restaurant. Number four, a forceful and aggressive athlete. What is going to be the word of the episode? I think I'm going to pick uh, Bainberry as the word of the episode because, uh, you know, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, so that is all that I have to say. You can turn me off if you're done with the words. Uh, I had an idea during uh, the recording of the last episode where I thought maybe uh, this is very you know, gets into more of my personal life, but maybe people want to know just sort of like what's like what I'm watching or like what's my recommendation or I don't know, something like that. Um, so I can just tell you a couple of shows that my wife and I are sort of watching or just watched. Uh, the first one is called uh, Living With Yourself. That is the show from uh, Netflix with Paul Rudd. And I don't know her name, but it's a very good Irish uh, actress who plays his wife uh, and some other people, too. But it's only eight, eight episodes, and they're pretty short, um, and so we were able to watch it in a couple of days. I enjoyed it. It's, you know, it's not, like, super funny or super dramatic or anything, but it's just kind of a fun show. Um, and it's sort of like, what would you do if you had this happen to you? Um, and so I'm not going to say anything more than that, uh, because maybe you don't know what it's about. 
but I thought it was kind of interesting. And Paul Rudd, of course, is uh, kind of my man crush. He is awesome and he can do no wrong. And he's great in Wet Hot American Summer. And he is hilarious. Uh, the other show that we are watching is called The Outsider. Uh, this is on HBO. It is based on a Stephen King book, which I have not read. Um, but uh, it's really interesting and uh, seems like it's de- dealing with some sort of strange paranormal something or other. Um, but yeah, and I think it's all directed by Jason, Jason Bateman, uh, who's a super talented guy as well. Um, you know, there's other stuff, but uh, oh, the Oscars were fun. I don't remember if I talked about that. Did I talk about that? I can't remember. Um, but yeah, mostly, uh, I agreed with the decisions. All right, that's enough talking. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary, the only podcast in the world where somebody is reading the entire dictionary. He is so weird. All right, the first word for this episode. Oh, you know what? Wait, there's a holiday. There's a holiday. It's a very, very important holiday today. What is it? I got to bring it up on my phone. It is called... Um, it is Maha Shivaratri. Shivaratri. It is a Hindu holiday. Uh, I don't know what that is. I can click on this link. Um, this year, this, this, uh, last year, Hindu holiday. What is it? Uh, it's not a public holiday. Businesses have normal opening hours. Thank you for telling me. Do Are you going to tell me what it is? Nope. But I hope you have a very happy Maha Shivaratri. Uh, that was absolutely not meant to be making fun of it at all. I just remembered there was something on the 21st, and I read it, and uh, I'm kind of curious what that holiday is. But I'm not Hindu, so I don't know. All right, the first word is Bangkok, B-A-N-G-K-O-K. It is a noun from 1916, a hat woven of fine palm fiber in the Philippines. This is from... Um, It means a fine straw. So maybe they used to use straw, a fine straw, to make these hats. Uh, It is, and they were made in Bangkok, Thailand. Next we have bangle. It is a noun from 1787. One, a stiff, usually ornamental bracelet or anklet slipped uh, slipped or clasped on. A bangle. There was a band... Were they in the 70s or the 80s called the Bengals? Was it an all-women band? I think it was. And are they the ones who did Walk Like an Egyptian? Maybe. Or I am a terrible child who was uh, living in the 80s. Um, they probably wore a lot of bangly jewelry. Uh, number two, an ornamental disc that hangs loosely as on a bracelet. This is a Hindi word, uh, bangly. Um which is interesting because I just talked about a holiday, a Hindu, Hindi holiday. Hindi holiday. Ooh, that's a fun phrase. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think if you see images of people uh, from that part of the world, uh, there is often a lot of sort of dangly, bangly jewelry. Uh, so we probably just stole it from that. All right, next we have bang on two words. It's an adjective from 1936 chiefly British, and it means exactly correct or appropriate. You are bang on with that description of that thing you've said. Next, we have Bang's Disease with a capital B. 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 This is a noun from circa 1929. The synonym is brucellosis. So the word cell is in there. Brucellosis, specifically contagious abortion of cattle caused by a brucella, and the scientific name is brucella abortus. Well, I have no idea what this is about. Something about cattle, uh, killing cattle, killing some something. It is from Bernard L.F. Bang. That was his last name. He died in 1932, and he was a Danish veterinarian. So I hope your cattle don't get Bang's disease. Next, we have Bang Tail. So this was mentioned in the last episode when we were talking about bangs, uh, you know, the hair, the hairstyle. Uh, and that said that it was probably short for bang tail, which means short tail. And then here we have the actual definition. Uh, by the way, it's a noun from 1921. And it's a synonym. Uh, the synonym is a racehorse. So I'm thinking that they would cut the tails of the horses short 
uh, because again here it says it's from bang tail, which means short tail. Uh, so they probably cut their tail short maybe for, you know, for some stupid racing purposes to, you know, oh, yeah, horse doesn't need its tail. I'm really hoping they just cut the hair short. But honestly, they probably cut the whole tail short knowing what people do to animals, which is ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, they probably were like, oh, well, this horse can go faster if I cut its tail. So I'm going to cut its tail and it's going to be called a bang tail. Enough about that. Next is bang up. There is a hyphen. It is an adjective from 1810, and it uh, the synonym is first rate, as in a bang up job. And next we have bang up again, but there is no hyphen. This is a verb from 1886, to cause extensive damage to. Like I banged up my car. Oh man, once... I saw my car, I was uh, at my parents' house, and the car was parked across the street and down a little bit, and I looked at the car from the porch, my parents' porch, and it looked exactly in the bumper like somebody had hit it. There was this huge dent. It must have been, I don't know, a foot wide or something, something like notice, noticeable from many, many feet away. I was like, who hit our car? How did we not hear that the car had been hit? And so I walked over there, and it turned out that it was just the way the light was hitting and lights lights and shadows were hitting and the curve of the bumper because it was right on the corner of the bumper. And I was like, who banged up my car? See, I'm so good at these. Uh, all right, next we have banny, B-A-N-I. It is the plural of the third form of the word ban. Uh, we read that a while ago. All right, next we have banish. This is a verb from the 14th century. Uh, it's just transitive. Uh, one, to require by authority to leave a country. We will banish you because you are a bandit. Number two, to drive out or remove from a home or place of usual resort or continuance. Number three, to clear away. Synonym is dispel, as in his discovery banishes anxiety. And that is a quote from... This is an interesting first name. It's probably not their real first name. Stringfellow Bar. What if your name was Stringfellow? Uh, would you make somebody call you by your first name or your whole name all the time? I would never let somebody say Mr. Bar. I'd say, you have to call me by my full name, Stringfellow Bar. What's your middle name? Rainbow Dolphin? Uh, let's see. Banisher is a noun, and banishment is also a noun, and we have some synonym information. Banish, exile, deport, transport mean to remove by authority from a state or country. Banish implies compulsory removal from a country not necessarily one's own, as in banished for seditious activities. Exile may imply compulsory removal or an enforced or voluntary absence from one's own country, as in a writer who exiled himself for political reasons. Deport implies sending out of the country an alien who has illegally entered or whose presence is judged inimical to the public welfare, uh, as in illegal aliens will be deported. We are not going to get into a conversation about people who are in a country illegally. Transport implies sending a convicted criminal to an overseas penal colony, as in a convict who was transported to Australia. Well, that's a weird example, but, I mean, it's a little bit too on the nose, don't you think? That supposedly uh, Britain transported all of their convicts to Australia, and those are the white people who then populated Australia, and who I think murdered probably and treated very badly all the Arab aboriginal people oh we're terrible um okay this we're going to talk about some etymology uh this is middle english from anglo-french banis which is a stem of banir of germanic origin akin to the old high german banan which means to command and there's more at the word ban next we have banister one N or two N's, it is a noun from 1641. One A, a handrail with its supporting posts. One B, synonym is handrail. Two, 
Synonym is the number two definition for baluster. Uh, Bannistered, with an E-D, is an adjective. Next we have banjax, B-A-N-J-A-X. It is a transitive verb from 1939. It is chiefly Irish. It's not something that we see usually in here. Synonyms are damage and ruin. Also, the synonym smash, banjax. I really want to hear this in context. Uh, any of my Irish listeners, please uh, call my Google Voice number, leave me a message using banjax in uh, the sentence, and or you can also leave me an email or tweet me or something. Next, we have banjo. It is a noun from 1739, a musical instrument with a drum-like body, a fretted neck, and usually four or five strings, which may be plucked or strummed. And banjoist is a noun. This, it says, this is probably of African origin, akin to the Kimbundu word, m- uh, m- sorry for my pronunciation. First of all, Kimbundu is K-I-M-B-U-N-D-U, and then the word is mbanza, so it's M-B-A-N-Z-A, and that is a similar instrument to the banjo, so we probably stole their word. Um, let's see, what do I have to say about banjos? We'll talk about that later. Next, we have banjo clock. It is two words. It's a noun from 1903. A pendulum clock whose shape suggests a banjo. Um, I probably have seen these, but I had no idea they were called banjo clocks. Who decided that they were going to make a clock look like a... Wait, does the pendulum look like a banjo? Or the, does the clock look like a banjo? Whose shape? Pendulum? I think it's the banjo that... No, the pendulum that looks like a banjo, which I guess makes sense. Okay, now we are on the last word for this episode. It is the first form of bank, B-A-N-K. It is a noun from the 13th century. One, a mound, pile, or ridge raised above the surrounding level as 1A, a piled up mass of cloud or fog. 1B, an undersea elevation rising especially from the continental shelf. Uh, Number two, the rising ground bordering a lake, river, or sea, or forming the edge of a cut or hollow. 3a, a steep slope as of a hill. 3b, the lateral inward tilt of a surface along a curve or of a vehicle as an airplane when turning. Like when the airplane takes a hard turn to the left or the right, you'd say that they're banking. And number four, a protective, protective or cushioning rim or piece. Um, the etymology says this is Middle English, probably of Scandinavian origin, akin to the Old Norse baki, B-A-K-K-I, which means bank, and it is akin to the Old English bank, B-E-N-C, which means bench. Uh, yeah, and there's more at the word bench, and that makes sense. Uh, when you're talking about bank in these terms, especially one and two, uh, it's like it's kind of like a bench. There's a, a horizontal or a flat part, and then it goes down or up or both. So we are going to pick a banjo as the word of the episode. Um, I I actually had a banjo for a little bit in high school. I think I don't. I think it was maybe my great uncle had it, and he didn't need it anymore, or he wasn't going to play it, or he was getting too old to play it, or something. Uh, And so we got it somehow. I really don't remember where we got it from exactly, but I got one and I was tuning it probably right when I got it. I was trying to tune it and it was one of the five string banjos. So there were the four tuning keys up at the end of the neck. And then the, the fifth one, maybe, I don't know how many of you know this, but the fifth tuning key is actually in the middle of the neck. So it's not with all the other ones. It's in the middle. And I was tuning, tuning, and I was turning the key and hitting the the note, the string, and it didn't sound different. I'd turn it and hit it and turn it and hit it, and it wasn't sounding any different until all of a sudden I turned it and the string popped and I had my arm over it. The string popped and it smacked my exposed skin on my my forearm. And I don't know, I think it was actually the high string I must have been plucking the wrong string because I think I was tightening the the high string and the metal is so thin. 
uh, and it just like whipped through my arm, and I had a welt that was maybe an inch or two long for a while. That hurt so, so bad. Uh, I learned my lesson that day. Uh, and I learned how to play a few chords on it, only a few, but it was enough to learn how to play the song Wild Thing. Wild Thing, I think I love you, that song. And I uh, I had some short little presentation with a couple people in like a history or English class, and uh, we used the banjo for some reason. And at the end of the presentation, somehow it came up that I could play the song. And so I played the song in front of my whole class. It was actually two classes combined. And it was we so it was a weird experience because I was not usually the type of person to be so extroverted like that and play a song in by myself, especially that song, in front of, you know, probably fifty people or something. Uh it was just a really weird moment. Um and it was silly, but they liked it, I guess. Uh but then we got rid of the banjo, we sold it, and we bought some drums. Uh, All right, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I think I need a new sign-off because I feel like the one that I have is just sort of lame. But I'm going to say it anyway. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. Today is 2-22-2020. A lot of twos. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, we're on the last quarter of page 96. What? All right, the first word is bank, B-A-N-K. This is the second form because, for those of you who are not listening in order, uh, the last, the first form was in the last episode. Uh, all right, we have five forms total. Uh, this is a transitive, well, we're going to start with the transitive verb definitions, and then we're going to do some intransitive definitions. It is from 1590. 1A, to raise a bank account. No, that is not what it says at all. To raise a bank about. I don't know what that is. 1B, to cover as a fire with fresh fuel and adjust the draft of air so as to keep in an inactive state. 1C, to build with the roadbed or track inclined laterally upward from the inside edge. Um, I think, yeah, I think I've seen like train tracks. They, they, they're sort of like a, like a hill up to it. Maybe that's what they're talking about. I think so. Number two, to heap or pile in a bank. 3A, to drive a ball in billiards into a cushion. Oh, yes. Trying to do a bank shot. I love trying to do that. I'm very bad at them. Um, But the whole idea about making a bank shot is it's all about angles. Uh, Too hard to describe here, but one trick that you can do is if you have one of those like tall, full-size mirrors, if you're going to hit the cue ball towards the bank, put the mirror up against the bank that you're going to hit it towards, and all you have to do is aim for the ball that you want to hit through the mirror. And if you aim it correctly, the cue ball will hit the bank and actually hit the cue ball. That's just a little trick. But I don't think you're about to go taking around a full-size mirror or even just a regular-size mirror with you when you go to the bar to play billiards. Where was I? 3B. To bounce a ball or shot off a surface as a blackboard into or toward a goal. As in, bank in a rebound. Four, to form a group in a tier, T-I-E-R. Now we have the intransitive definitions. One, to rise in or form a bank, often used with the word up, as in clouds would bank up about midday and showers fall. Did I read that correctly? I think I did. That is a quote from William Beebe, or Beeb, B-E-E-B-E. Two A, to incline an airplane laterally. 2B1, to incline laterally. 2B2, to follow a curve or incline, as in skiers banking around the turn. Now we have the third form of bank. This is a noun from the 15th century. 1A, 
an establishment for the custody, loan, exchange, or issue of money, for the extension of credit, and for facilitating the transmission of funds. That's a definition of the word bank. I don't know what I'm trying to say. 1B is obsolete, the table, counter, or place of business of a money changer. 2. A person conducting a gambling house or game, specifically the synonym dealer. 3. A supply of something held in reserve, as 3A, the fund of supplies as money, chips, or pieces held by the banker or dealer for use in a game. I bet all of you wanted to be the banker in Monopoly. I did. I didn't cheat. I swear, I didn't cheat. I just liked being able to... I liked being the one who handed out the money. But I know some of you out there, you wanted to be the banker so you could grab, you know, $500 bills on the sly. Not cool, not cool. All right, 3B. As fund of pieces belonging to a game. Did it, What did I say? A fund of pieces belonging to a game as dominoes from which the players draw. Four, a place where something is held available, as in memory banks. My memory banks, I think, are full, and they're also failing. Especially, a depot for the collection and storage of a biological product, as in a blood bank. Next, uh, no, let's see, we, we're going to skip that. Now we have the fourth form of bank. It is uh, a verb from circa 1751. Uh, intransitive definitions are first. One, to manage a bank. Two, to deposit money or have an account in a bank. Now the transitive definition, to deposit or store in a bank. Bank on is a phrase, and it means to depend or rely on, as in, can always bank on her friendship. Oh, that's such a good friend. Now we have the fifth and final form of bank. It is a noun from... 1614. 1. A group or series of objects arranged together in a row or a tier, as 1A, a set of elevators. 1B, a row or tier of telephones. Number 2. One of the horizontal and usually secondary or lower divisions of a headline. Yep. Now we are going to move on to other words that are not the word bank. First is bankable. It is an adjective from 1818. 1. Acceptable to or at a bank, as in bankable currency. Number 2. Sure to bring in a profit, as in Hollywood's most bankable star. And that is a quote from Sidney Sheldon. I have a feeling that that is an old quote. Bankability is a noun. Next we have bank book. A noun from 1714. The depositor's book in which a bank record records records or records records deposits and withdrawals, called also passbook. <clears throat> oh yes, I'm almost at the end of the page, and my voice could use a rest. Next is bank card. Two words, noun from 1970. A card as a credit card or an ATM card issued by a bank. Next is bank discount. Two words, noun from 1841, the interest discounted in advance on a note and computed on the face value of the note. Next is banker, first form. It is a noun from 1534. One, one that engages in the business of banking. Number two, the player who keeps the bank in various games. Bankerly is an adjective. And this would have been a much more appropriate place to talk about being the banker in Monopoly. Now we have the second form of banker. It is a noun from 1666. A person or boat employed in the cod fishery on the Newfoundland banks. Maybe maybe in the water they've got a big bank. Like maybe like we were talking about before, there's like a big outstretch of, uh, of uh, land under the water and then it goes way down and gets deeper and deeper, and so that one spot is a bank. I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. Next, we have banker's acceptance. It is two words, noun from circa 1924. A short-term credit instrument 
issued by an importer's bank that guarantees payment of an exporter's invoice. Now we have bank holiday. It is two words. Noun from 1871. Number one is British, and it's uh, the synonym is legal holiday. Number two, a period when banks in general are closed often by government fiat? Fiat? I know the car fiat, but I don't know what the word is regularly. Often closed, or closed often by government fiat. Okay, next we have banking. It is a noun from 1735. That came out real weird. The business of a bank or a banker. Next is bank money. That just sounds like some phrase that uh, some kid made up. It is two words, noun from 1904, a medium of exchange consisting chiefly of checks and drafts. Next is bank note, uh, noun from 1695, a promissory note issued by a bank payable to bearer on demand without interest and acceptable as money. Next is, uh, well, this is the last word. We're going to do both forms one and two. It is bankroll, B-A-N-K-R-O-L-L. Noun from 1887, supply of money. Synonym is funds. And then the second form of bankroll is a verb from 1928. Uh, This is a, a transitive verb. To supply money for. And then in parentheses, it says a business, project, or person. And bankroller is a noun. Uh, so we got to pick one of these as the word of the episode. Um, I will pick something. Um, why? Some of these are really easy. It's like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to pick. And sometimes I don't. Um, raise a bank about bank. Yeah. I mean, whatever. We'll just pick bank. No, we'll pick bank holiday because sometimes I get those off of work. That is the end of the episode. Thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, you know, that's um, that's what's going on. All right, talk to you later. Bye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary, the only podcast in the world where some idiot is reading the dictionary. I was listening to the Ronan Farrow episode on Mark Maron's podcast, WTF, right before I started recording this episode, and boy, do I feel dumb. Uh, He is a very, very smart man, and, uh, you know, just listening to the words he uses and the fact that he knows how to use those words, uh, and just a very smart man in general, uh, yeah, I just feel like, wow, especially when it comes to words, um, I've always been pretty dumb in that world. There's a there's a part of my brain that is lacking and uh, you know I stumble over words. I can't think of words. I'm learning new words. Um, this is part of the reason why I'm doing this is because there's a lot of words out there that I don't know. Um, I'm never going to comprehend them all. I'm never going to remember them all. Um, but it is helping. Uh, my brain in some way. Um, And I think I really, really needed that. I'm much better at visual things and math and science and stuff like that. And uh, this world of words uh, is hard for me, always has been hard for me. Um, So uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. And, um, you know, I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, you are dumb. You didn't know this word. God, you're silly. Um, But I, I... I'm doing this for myself, and if any of you are enjoying this, I I hope you get some enjoyment out of hearing me stumble and be stupid. All right, let's talk about some words. Uh, The first word is bankrupt, B-A-N-K-R-U-P-T. It is the first form. It is a noun from 1533, 1A, a person who has done any of the acts that by law entitle creditors to have his or her estate administered for their benefit. 1b. A person judiciously declared subject to having his or her estate administered under the bankrupt laws for the benefit of creditors. 1c. A person who becomes solvent. 2. A person who is completely lacking in a particular desirable quality or attribute, as in a moral bankrupt. This is a modified form or version of 
Middle fr- French uh, and Old Italian, Middle French, Bancarut, B-A-N-Q-U-E-R-O-U-T-E. That means bankruptcy. From Old Italian, Bancarata, from Banca, which means bank, plus rata, which means broken. So Bancarata is Banca plus rata, which means basically broken bank. Uh, and that's uh, from Latin, rupta which is the feminine of raptas, which is from the verb rompere, which means to break. And there's more at the word bank and reeve, R-E-A-V-E. Uh, so broken bank is where we go get the word bankrupt. Uh, now we have the second form of bankrupt. It is an adjective from 1566, 1A, uh, reduced to a state of financial ruin. Synonym is impoverished, specifically legally declared a bankrupt, as in the company went bankrupt. 1B, of or relating to bankrupts or bankruptcy, as in bankrupt laws. 2A, we have the synonyms broken and ruined, as in a bankrupt professional career. 2B, exhausted of valuable qualities. Synonym is sterile or sterile, however you want to say that. As in, a bankrupt old culture. 2C, synonym is destitute, and it is used with the word of or in, as in, bankrupt of all merciful feelings. Now we have the third form of bankrupt. It is a verb from 1588, and it looks like it's just transitive. One, to reduce to bankruptcy. Number two, synonym is impoverish, as in defections had bankrupted the party of its brain power. What an interesting example. Defections had bankrupted the party of its brain power. I wonder if that's a quote from something. Uh, And then at the end, we have a synonym, which is the word deplete. Now we have the word bankruptcy. It is a noun from 1700. One, the quality or state of being bankrupt. Two, utter failure or impoverishment. Next is bank shot. It is two words, and uh, we talked about this a little bit in, uh, I guess that was the last episode uh, with the word bank. Uh, So, bank shot. It is a noun from 1800. One, a shot in billiards and pool in which a player banks the cue ball or the object ball. Uh, So, I guess that would be the ball that is hit uh, by the cue ball. Number two, a shot in basketball to rebound from the backboard into the basket. Now I want to go play some billiards. Uh, I really don't get a chance to do that too often. Oh, I have funny stories about billiards, but I'm not going to tell them on this podcast. Uh, All right, next we have Banksia, B-A-N-K-S-I-A. Uh, It is a noun from 1783, any of a genus of Australian evergreen trees or shrubs of the Protea family with alternate leathery leaves and flowers in dense cylindrical heads. We'll uh, see if we can post a picture of this one. This is uh, New Latin. It's a genus name from Sir Joseph Banks, uh, who I'm guessing first named this uh, Australian evergreen tree, Banksia. Um, no, I think I said Banksia. It's more Banksia. So Banksia, because his last name was Banks. Next, we have Bankside. It is a noun from the 15th century. The slope of a bank, especially of a stream. So it's the side that has the bank of a river or a stream. Next is Banner, B-A-N-N-E-R. It is the first form. It is a noun from the 13th century. 1A, a piece of cloth attached by one edge to a staff and used by a leader uh, and as his standard. Used by a leader as his standard. And then in parentheses after leader, it says as a monarch or feudal lord. Uh, if you know to use a recent example, uh, if any of you are fans of Game of Thrones, you see banners all the time in that show, uh, and also people talking about banners, uh, bannermen, um, which is not in the dictionary, but it's you know the people who hold the banners, the people who have pledged allegiance uh, to that leader, that monarch, that feudal lord, whatever they are. 
Uh, yeah, that's what that is. Uh, now we have 1b, and we just have the number one definition for the second form of flag. 1c. Uh, one presented as an award or honor. Let me try that again. One presented as an award of honor or distinction. 2. A headline in large type running across a newspaper page. 3. A strip of cloth on which a sign is painted, as in, welcome banners stretched across the street. Oh yeah, you see that a lot, especially in movies and TV shows. Um, I guess they happen in the real world too, but usually I see them in movies and TV shows. 4. A name, slogan, or goal associated with a particular group or ideology, as in, the new banner is community control. That was in quotes. Uh, and that is a quote from F.M. Herchinger. Uh, recently, I said that I was going to try and start finding where these quotes are from. Um, and after a few episodes of doing that, I kind of decided to stop doing that because, um, first of all, I can't even find maybe half of them or more. And, um, you know, it just takes a little bit more mental effort that I sometimes don't feel like doing. Uh, so if I'm motivated, maybe I'll go look up where this quote is from. Uh, but sometimes it's kind of hard, actually, to find where the quote is from. And uh, so if you are curious where this quote from F.M. Hetchinger came from, uh, which is, the new banner is community control, then you should go look it up. Uh, and so just to finish off this number four definition, it says it's often used with the word under, as in, every new administration arrives under the banner of change. And that is a quote from John Cogley, C-O-G-L-E-Y. Number five, an advertisement graphic that runs usually across the top of a worldwide web page. And this is calling out the datedness a little bit of this book, um, which I think is from 2012, although I can't remember. Uh, I don't feel like we really use the phrase World Wide Web anymore. Uh, there's all, all obviously www.whatever.com or .whatever, uh, but people don't usually say the World Wide Web. Uh, so this definition needs to be updated a little bit and probably has been updated. Um, all right, next we have the second form. No, uh, we're going to talk about the etymology. Uh, it is from Middle English, banere, um, something like that, from Anglo-French of Germanic origin, akin to the Gothic word bandwo, which means sign, probably akin to the Greek phanin, which means to show, and there's more at the word fancy. Uh, so phanin must be related to fancy, so it's very showy and fancy. That's that's the relationship I'm thinking of for that one. Uh, all right, now we have the second form of banner. It is a transitive verb from 1809. One, to furnish with a banner. Two, to print as a news story under a banner usually on the front page. The third form of banner is an adjective from 1840. One, prominent in support of a political party, as in a banner democratic country. Number two, distinguished from all others, especially in excellence, as in a banner year for business. Now we have banneret. Uh, it is the first form. It is a noun from the 14th century. A knight, that is K-N-I-G-H-T, like a knight in shining armor, a knight leading his vassals into the field under his own banner. A banneret. Um, now we have the second form of banneret. It is, uh, by the way, I didn't spell it before. It's the word banner with an E-T. And in this second form, it could be with an E-T-T-E. -T -E. Uh, like, you know, a little thing. Uh, this is a noun from the 14th century, and it is just a small banner. Very, very tiny. You can just stick it in your pocket. Next, we have banner roll. It is a noun from 1548, and we have the synonym banderol. Uh, we must have read that a while ago, and I don't remember what that means. Last word for this episode is banister, B-A-N-N-I-S-T-E-R, and it is a variation of banister with only one N. And uh, go back a few episodes to learn what that is. Uh, so we need to pick a word of the episode. I'm going to pick Banksia as the word because it was um, probably the most unique of all the words here, other than maybe banister or maybe banner, banner roll. 
I don't know. I don't know what a band are all those. Anyway, Banksy is the word of the episode. Thank you very much for joining me and listening to me banter on about words that start with the letter B in this case, and eventually C and D, and you get the picture. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. Somehow you found it, and thank you very much. Please go rate and review on whatever platform you're listening on, uh, preferably five stars, and then give me some constructive criticism in your review if you so choose. Otherwise, tell me how great I am. I need that validation. Uh, So let's uh, say some words. First word is Bannock. B-A-N-N-O-C-K. It is a noun from before the 12th century. One, a usually unleavened flatbread or biscuit made with oatmeal or barley meal. It's a bannock. I don't know what that is. It's it's old. Uh, Now we have number two. It is chiefly from New England. Uh, The synonym is cornbread. So maybe they call cornbread bannock in New England, especially a thin cake baked on a griddle. Well, that sounds tasty. And now we have the word bans, B-A-N-N-S. It is a noun from the 14th century. Public announcement, especially in church, of a proposed marriage. Well, I'm not a church-going person, uh, so I am not familiar at all with this word. So what does that mean exactly? So when uh, somebody proposed marriage, so when somebody was engaged... Uh, the public announcement of that engagement in church is called a bans. I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, from Middle English, bane or ban, which is a proclamation or a ban. Now we have banquet. It is the first form. It's a noun from the 15th century. One, a sumptuous feast. Oh, that's a fun phrase. A sumptuous feast, especially an elaborate and often ceremonious meal for numerous people, often in honor of a person, as in a state banquet. Number two, a meal held in recognition of some occasion or achievement, as in an awards banquet. I think Sumptuous Feast would be a good band name. Next we have, uh, let's see, let's look at the etymology. It is Middle French from Old Italian Banchetto, from the diminutive of banca, which means bench or bank. Now we have the second form of banquet. It is uh, a verb from circa 1500. Intransitive definition is first, to partake of a banquet. And the transitive definition says to treat with a banquet. Synonym is feast. And banqueter. Is that how you say that? Banqueter. Yeah, that's a noun. That is one who attends a banquet. Next, we have banquet room, two words, noun from 1717, a large room, as in a restaurant or to hotel, I'm fumbling over my words, uh, suitable for banquets. Next, we have banquette, and I think there's a couple ways to pronounce it, but that's the main one, and that's the one that I like, B-A-N-Q-U-E-T-T-E. It is a noun from 1629, 1A, a raised way along the inside of a parapet or trench for gunners or guns. Banquet. Uh, 1B is southern, and we have the synonym sidewalk. So uh, I guess in the south they call sidewalks banquettes. I should go ask somebody, hey, are you from the south? Let me know. Uh, now we have 2A, a long upholstered bench. Boy, this is a very diverse group of uh, definitions for the word banquette. To B, a sofa having one rollover arm. To C, a built-in, usually upholstered bench along a wall. I had no idea that was called a banquette. Uh, let's see, this is French from Middle French from Old Ossetan uh, banqueta, which is a diminutive of banque, which means bench of Germanic origin akin to the Old English bank, which means bench. That's that's the bench. Um, I need to see if I, this whole thing about a parapet or trench for gunners or guns, uh, I want to see uh, what that looks like because I can't visualize it. Now we have Banquo, uh, capital B-A-N-Q-U-O. It is a noun from 1607, 
a murdered Scottish thane in Shakespeare's Macbeth, whose ghost appears to Macbeth. I have seen or read Macbeth, uh, probably seen the movie too, uh, but I really don't remember it so well. So I guess uh, Banquo is the name of one of the characters. Um, I should be more well-read, especially when it comes to Shakespeare. Now we have Banshee. It is a noun from 1771, a female spirit in Gaelic folklore whose appearance or wailing warns a family that one of them will soon die. You don't want to hear that sound, I'm guessing. This is Irish from uh, the word, well, I'm going to screw up the pronunciation of this, but it is uh, spelled Bean Sidhe. Bean is B-E-A-N and Sidhe is S-I-D-H-E. Uh, so that's not how it's pronounced, but that's how I pronounced it. Um, it is also from the, I think this is saying Scottish Gaelic. Um, as Yeah, Scottish Gaelic word. Uh, Bin Sith. Uh, it's like, it's a Sith, like in Star Wars, and then the word Bean in front of it. Uh, I really want to know how that's pronounced, though. Uh, that literally means woman of fairyland. Bin Sith. I wonder if... Um, there's that cartoon on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called Disenchantment. It's from, um, oh, what's his name? The guy who made The Simpsons, um, Matt Groening. Uh, I wonder if the name Bean is related at all to this this word Bean, because uh, the main character's name is Bean in that in that show. I think. Uh, all right. Next we have Bantam. B-A-N-T-A-M. It is the first form. It is a noun from 1740. One, any of numerous small domestic fowls that are often miniatures of members of the standard breeds. Number two, a person of diminutive stature and often combative disposition. I'm not familiar with this. What this is? Bantam? Uh, So this is from Bantam, which is a former residency in Java. I don't know if that means it's a town. Java is one of the islands in Indonesia. uh, So I don't know if Bantam is just a part of that island. Um, And are the the people there of diminutive stature and often combative uh, disposition? Um, This seems like a weird word. Um, Yeah. Now we have... The second form of bantam, it is an adjective of eight, uh, from 1881. One, we have these synonyms small and diminutive. Number two, pertly combative. Man, I am so curious where this word came from exactly. Now we have bantam weight. Uh, okay, so this is a noun from 1884. A boxer in a weight division having a maximum limit of 118 pounds for professionals and 119 pounds for amateurs compared to featherweight and flyweight. I don't follow the world of fighting in any way, but I have heard of this bantamweight. I had no idea what it was, Uh, but it is someone who is small and light. Uh, 118 pounds for an adult person is pretty small. Um, I'm guessing uh, the guys on... The the horses, the you know the jockeys, uh, they're probably about that same size. Um, so, I think they got this bantam weight from obviously the word bantam, um, and it seems like bantam comes from this word Java. So, yeah, those must be just small and feisty people. Now we have bantang, b a n t e n g. It is a noun from eighteen seventeen. A wild ox of southeastern Asia, sometimes domesticated for use as a draft animal or for its meat. This is from uh, Malay of Indonesia, from the Java word bantang, uh, spelled the same way, but there's an accent on the E. Next, we have banter. It is the first form. uh, It's a verb from 1653. One, to speak to or address in a witty and teasing manner. Number two is archaic. We have the synonym delude. Delude. How do you say that word? Uh, Number three is chiefly southern and midland, and we have the synonym challenge. Uh, I think I forgot to mention that those were the transitive definitions. Now we have the intransitive definition, which means to speak or act playfully or wittily. Banterer is a noun, and banteringly is an adverb. 
The origin of this, by the way, is unknown. Now we have the second form of banter. It is a noun from 1688. Good-natured and usually witty and animated joking. This reminds me of the band The Flight of the Concords. They have a, um, let's see, they have a, an album. I think it's partially a live album. And in it, uh, and from one of their live appearances, they talked about, uh, yeah, sometimes we just banter and we, ha- we have great banter. Um, I don't know. If I can find a good clip of it, I'll put it in. Thank you. Are you just bantering? Yeah, right? this is just banter. There's songs and then there's banter. Don't don't freak out. It's all it's part of being talking. a band. We're just, we're just talking. It's, it's basically just, just it's, talking. It is just, just talking. Yeah. Just professional. Yeah. But they're... Oh, man. Those guys are so funny. Okay. Next we have bantling. Uh, it is a noun from 1593. A very young child. This is... Perhaps a modified form of the German Bankling, which means, of all things, bastard, uh, from the word bank, which means bench. By the way, Bankling and Bank, I said bank before, but it's Bank, probably. Uh, Those are both capitalized Bs. I'm not sure why. Um, So Bank means bench from Old High German, and there's more at the word bench. Now we have Bantu. It's uh, capital B-A-N-T-U. It is a noun from 1862. One, a family of Niger-Congo languages spoken in Central and Southern Africa. Number two, a member of any of a group of African peoples who speak Bantu languages. I'm really learning about a lot of new languages. No, they're not new languages. They're new to me. Um, Bantu, I think there was like Wolof recently and there were some other ones that i was like is that a language i have no idea uh let's see this is from ba which is a plural noun classifier plus untu which is a noun base meaning person in several bantu languages Uh, so that's where we get the word bantu now we have oh this is our last word bantu stan Bantustan, so I'm guessing it's related to the previous word, capital B-A-N-T-U-S-T-A-N. It is a noun from 1949. Any of several all-black enclaves formerly in the Republic of South Africa that had a limited degree of self-government. And this is Bantu plus Stan, which means land. That's why you see so many countries that end in Stan. It means land. Um, as in Hindustan. Well, I guess that's an area that's in the Hindu area. Ah, that was terrible. Um, all right, what is the word of the episode? This, there was a surprisingly uh, a large variety of words uh, in this. <clears throat> um, oh, boy, this is difficult. Um, I'll pick Banshee. As the word of the episode, congratulations to all you banshees out there. You are finally getting some recognition. Uh, That's all I got to say. Just real quick, uh, at the time of recording, yesterday we had the memorial service for my grandma, which was absolutely amazing. Um, I can't even describe all the emotions. Uh, Sadness, laughter, joy, everything... Um, thank you to all the people who came, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a really good, bittersweet, but good time. Um, anyway, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening to me talk about some words, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, you word nerds. Thank you for turning on this podcast, and uh, thanks. It's a good time we're having. Yeah. Um, All right, this might be a little bit of a longer episode, but I'll try and not chat too much. Just looking at the way the words fall on the page, um, that's that's the way it's going to be. All right, the first word is banyan. Oh, banyan. Okay, B-A-N-Y-A-N. It is a noun from 1634. Um, An East Indian fig tree of the mulberry family with branches that send out roots which grow down to the soil and form secondary trunks. Uh, Let's see. The etymology says this is uh, earlier Banyan Gujarati trader. Is that a person? No, I don't know. From the 
uh, Portuguese Banyan, which is probably from the Tamil Vanian, which means traitor, uh, from the Sanskrit Vaniha or Vaniha, uh, which is from a tree of the species of Iran under which such traders conducted business. Oh, so fascinating. Um, wow, this just got way more interesting to me. Uh, so traders would conduct business under this tree probably because it has a very wide... Um, the, the 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 branches and the leaves are very wide, so it creates a lot of like shade under it. Um, and so they would go conduct business, probably in secret. Um, also because oh yeah, 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 so much stuff in my head. Um, so the branches, it like it said, it sends down uh, roots from the tree into the ground. Uh, there are some roots, I think, from the trunk, but in addition, it sends out. So it, it's. Um, I actually have seen one of these. I've been in one of these trees in Hawaii, uh, and it's it's such an interesting tree. Um, and so you can be kind of secretive, um, especially at nighttime. I'm sure you can be kind of secretive and not probably not people wouldn't know that you were there. Um, and so they got the word. Uh, they took the word traitor. And ended up naming the tree after it. That's what I'm gathering from this information, which is just really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I saw one of these banyan trees. I don't know if it's like one of the largest or something, but um, yeah, it, 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 I don't know. That was the first and only time I've been around a banyan tree. And then your kids are like climbing through the, the roots and it's really fascinating. Uh, we're going to have to post a picture of that. Maybe I can find the actual tree and post it. Um, all right, next we have Banzai. It is a noun from 1892. A Japan uh, whoa, that came out weird. A Japanese cheer or war cry. And uh, the etymology says it's from Japan. Uh, next we have Banzai attack. It is two words, noun from 1944. A mass attack by Japanese soldiers in World War II. Also, an all out, usually desperate attack. Now we have Banzai Charge, two words, noun from 1942. One, synonym is Banzai Attack. Number two, a determined, often reckless act. Now we have Baobab or Baobab, B-A-O-B-A-B. It is a noun from 1640, a broad-trunked tropical tree of the silk cotton family that is native to Africa and has an edible acidic fruit resembling a gourd and bark used in making paper, cloth, and rope. Also, any of several related trees, chiefly in Madagascar and Australia. And the scientific name is Adansonia digitata. And I actually forgot to mention the uh, scientific name for the banyan tree, uh, Ficus bengalensis. Uh, okay, so we are back to Baobab. Uh, I read all of that. That's good. Very, very... I'm happy for you that you did that. I've heard of these trees. I, I, If I remember correctly, I think these might be the ones that where the trunks are kind of um, curved. It's like they're sort of bulging out in the middle. I could be wrong, uh, but I'll take a look and see if I can find a picture of one. All right, next we have... I guess it's just pronounced Bop or Bap. It is spelled B-A-P. It is a noun from circa 1575. It is British, and it means a small bun or roll. Yeah, can I have a bap, please? Uh, the origin is unknown. Now we have bap or bapt. It is a capital B-A-P or B-A-P-T. It is an abbreviation for Baptist. Now we have the word baptigia or baptigia. It is a noun from circa 1868, any of a genus of North American plants of the legume family having showy papillonaceous, that's not how you say it, papillonaceous flowers similar in form to those of the pea plant. Uh, let's see, this is the genus name uh, from the Greek baptisis, which means a dipping uh, from the word baptine. So this, uh, well, we're going to get into the baptism words, um, but that's interesting. That's what that word, uh, where we get baptism is from the word a dipping, uh, just dipping, or a dipping, actually, which is uh, the Greek word baptisis. Um, I bet all the, the Baptists already knew that, but I didn't. All right, so now we have baptism. 
It is a noun from the 14th century. Oh, obviously, yes. The when you the uh, when you're baptized, that's you're being dipped into water. One uh, a a Christian sacrament marked by ritual uh, ritual use of water and admitting the recipient to the Christian community. One uh, b a non Christian rite using water for ritual purification. One c is from Christian Science. Purification by or submergence in spirit. Two, an act, experience, or ordeal by which one is purified, sanctified, initiated, or named. Baptismal is a, an adjective, especially southern. Let's see, baptismal, bop. I guess in uh, more, more southern, they'd say baptismal. Uh, that's, what they, that's what the pronunciation guide tells me. And baptismally is an adverb. Uh, yes. Next, we have baptismal name. It is a noun from 1711, a name given at Christen christening or confirmation. Next is baptism of fire. Uh, it's from 1625. One, an introductory or initial experience that is a severe ordeal, especially a soldier's first exposure to enemy fire. Number two, a spiritual baptism by a gift of the Holy Spirit often used in allusion to, uh, okay, this is a Bible thing, uh, Acts 2, 3 to 4, and MT, I don't know what MT means, uh, 3, 11. As I've said in the past, there's a lot of Christian stuff in this book. They do obviously have some stuff from other religions, uh, but I do feel like I see a lot more Christian stuff than anything else. Um, and, you know, that's what it is. This is the book I'm reading. Next, we have Baptist. Uh, this, it's a noun from the 13th century. One, one that baptizes. Two, uh, when it's capitalized, a member or adherent of an evangelical Protestant dom denomination marked by congregational policy and baptism by immersion of believers only. Baptist with a capital B is an adjective. Next is Baptistry. Baptistry. Uh, it is a noun from the 14th century, a part of a church or formerly a separate building used for baptism. And next and last word, I guess it didn't take all that long. I thought it was going to take longer to get through these. Uh, last word is baptize. B-A-P-T-I-Z-E. Uh, you could also do T-I-S-E. And uh, yeah, again, it's telling me in Southern, it's Bob. Baptize, not baptize, or bab. It's just a, a B instead of a P. Okay, this is a verb from the 13th century. Transitive definitions are first. One, to administer baptism. Two, that is the end of that definition. Two A, to purify or cleanse spiritually, especially by a purging experience or ordeal. Two B, Synonym is initiate. Three, to give a name to, as at bapt baptism. Synonym is christen. And now we have the intransitive definition. To administer baptism. Baptizer is a noun. And uh, let's see. The etymology says this is from Anglo-French baptiser, which is from the Latin baptizare, from the Greek baptizin, which means to dip or baptize from baptin, which means to dip or dye, uh, like D-Y-E, and it is akin to the Old Norse, this is interesting, uh, kvefa, K-V-E-F-J-A. I'm very confused by Norse words. Oh, is that what that is? Old, I think it is, O-N. Yep, Old Norse. Um, and, uh, th oh, so that word, kvefa, kvefa, uh, that means to quench. Uh, so the word of the episode is going to be banyan. Uh, that is the banyan tree from the beginning of the episode. Oh, and it shows a black and white picture of a banyan tree um, where, you know, there's a large trunk and then the branches spread out very far. And then there's more trunks, like skinny trunks that come down from the branches. Um, and if you ever get a chance to see a banyan tree in person, I highly recommend that you do. And um, that is it for this episode. 
Um, I think, let's see, today is February 25th, and I looked it up. Oh, today is Mardi Gras, and uh, this thing is saying Shrove Tuesday, which I think is also, um, people also like to say Fat Tuesday. So today is the day that people are basically indulging in everything that they can. Um, there's a lot of fatty foods, sugary foods that are being eaten, king cakes and punchkis and all that stuff. And uh, just a lot of um, a lot of craziness happening because I think if I have learned correctly over my many years of not studying anything, uh, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of Lent, I think, um, where people decide to give up something for 40 days. You can have your own opinions on that. I have my own opinions on that. And uh, that's all I will say. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Dictionary and all the other episodes of The Dictionary. And until next time, this is Spencer reading The Dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the podcast Dictionary, the only podcast in the world where some person is reading The Dictionary, to my knowledge. And uh, so today is February 26th. As I mentioned in the last episode, today is Ash Wednesday. I think it's personally, I think it's kind of weird that people do this, uh, but that is my own opinion. Uh, you are, it, it is valid and you are uh, totally valid to have your own opinions. Um, it's just, it can be a little jarring uh, when you see somebody and they have something um, on their forehead. It's, it's just a little bit weird when you didn't grow up with that. Um, but I don't judge them. They That's what they want to do, and that is cool. And, um, you know, do it. Do what you want to do. Do you got it? You got to be yourself. Um, all right. Oh, sorry for all the lip smacks. All right. So as I said, the last episode was probably going to be a little bit long. It really wasn't. But this one is probably going to be a little bit short. So I'm sorry that I'm not giving you enough content. Uh, by the way, I'll just uh, say my normal stuff that I say sometimes. Um, all of my uh, contact info is in the episode description. So if you want to say something, uh, go ahead and contact me in various ways. And if you want to join the Patreon, at the $2 level, you get episodes as soon as they're ready to go. And uh, let's see. And at the $5 level, you will get exclusive episodes. And uh, I've just been very, very busy. And uh, let's see. And that's, I think, it. Okay. Oh, oh, and there's a Google Voice number. If you want to leave me a voicemail, nobody has left me one yet, but if you want to leave me a voicemail, I have a Google Voice, and you can call and leave a message, and maybe I'll play it on the episode. If you're nice. I don't know. Not necessarily. All right. The first word for this episode is bar. B-A-R. It is the first form. And uh, let's see. Spoiler alert. All of these words are going to start with bar, including the first word of the next episode. Okay, bar. It is a noun from the 12th century. Lots and lots of definitions for this one. 1A, a straight piece, as of wood or metal, that is longer than it is wide and has of various uses, as for a lever, support, barrier, or fastening. 1B, a solid piece or block of material that is longer than it is wide, as in a bar of gold, also as in a candy bar. Mmm, candy bar. Uh, 1C, a usually rigid piece, as of wood or metal, longer than it is wide that is used as a handle or support, especially a handrail used by ballet dancers to maintain balance while exercising. Number two. Something that obstructs or prevents passage, progress, or action, as to A, the destruction of an action or claim in law. Oh, so that's where they say they take the bar. Let me let me read that again. Something that obstructs or prevents passage, progress, or action, as to A, the destruction of an action or claim in law. Also, a plea or objection that affects such destruction. Well, I still don't totally understand it, but at least I'm uh, getting some level of knowledge of why the word bar is in the law world. Uh, All right, 2B, an intangible or non-physical impedent. Impedent? 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 Sure. 2C, a submerged or partly submerged bank as of sand, along a shore, or in a river, often obstructing navigation. 3A1, 
the railing in a courtroom that encloses the place about the judge where prisoners are stationed or where the business of the court is transacted in civil cases. Uh, so that's another situation where it has to do with the lawyering world. Uh, so I wonder if which one is it that they get uh, to take the bar. So interesting. All right, 3A2. We have the synonyms court and tribunal. 3A3. A particular system of courts. 3A4. An authority or tribunal that hands down judgment. Aha. We're getting, we're cracking the case. 3B1. The barrier in the English inns of court that formerly separated the seats of the benchers or readers from the body of the hall occupied by the students. Uh, 3B2. The whole body of barristers. Ah, see that the barristers, the word bar is in there. That this word obviously is very, very old. They've been using this uh, in this world for a long time. Okay, 3B2. The whole body of barristers or lawyers qualified to practice in the courts of any jurisdiction. 2B3. The profession of a barrister or lawyer. 4. A straight stripe band or line much longer than it is wide, as for A, one or two, no, one of two or more horizontal stripes on a heraldic shield. For B, a metal or embroidered strip worn on a usually military uniform, especially to indicate rank as of a company officer or service. 5A, a court, uh, no, a counter at which food or especially alcohol beverages are served. 5B, we have the synonym bar room, all one word, B-A-R-R-O-O-M. 5C, we have the 2B definition for the word shop. 6A, a vertical line across the musical staff before the initial measure accent. Uh, 6B, we have the synonym measure. 7, uh, that would be measure in music. Uh, number 7, a lace and embroidery joining covered with buttonhole stitch for connecting various parts of the pattern in needlepoint lace and cutwork. 8, we have the synonym standard, as in, wants to raise the bar for improving new drugs. And then we have a phrase, behind bars, and that means in jail. So I'm going to do a little count here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 definitions, 24 if you include behind bars. Whoo, that was a long one. All right, now we have the second form of bar. It is a verb from the 13th century. 1A, to fasten with a bar. 1B, to place bars across to prevent ingress or egress, as in, bar the door. They do that a lot in zombie movies. Number two, to mark with bars. Synonym is stripe. 3A, to confine or shut in by or as if by bars. 3B, to set aside, synonym is rule out, as in, did not bar the possibility of further measures. 3C, to keep out, synonym is exclude, as in, barring him from the club. 4A, to, Im uh, what? to interpose legal objection to or to the claim of. 4B, synonyms are prevent and forbid, as in, a decision barring his participation. Now we have the third form of bar. It is a preposition from 1714. We have the synonym accept. As it, uh, it's spelled E-X-C-E-P-T. As in, the country's most popular actor, bar none. Now we have the fourth form of bar. It is a noun from 1910. A unit of measure equal to 100,000 pascals. Uh, this is German from the Greek baros, B-A-R-O-S. I know I've heard of pascals or pascals. I don't remember what they are exactly, uh, what they're related to. Um, 
how big or how small they are, uh, but a bar is 100,000 of them, which is a lot, I would assume. Oh, well, it's a unit of pressure. It says it's a unit of pressure. Uh, but what exactly? Tell me more. Now we have the fifth form of bar. It is an abbreviation for one, barometer or barometric, and number two, barrel. Like uh, you put fish in a barrel. Now we have bar, capital B, lowercase a r. It is an abbreviation for barrack or baruch. Uh, did we? No, we haven't gotten there yet. B a r u c h. Uh, I could see that being pronounced a number of different ways. Now we have bar again. The B and the A are capitalized. This is an abbreviation for Bachelor of Architecture. And the last word is bar. If you couldn't tell, capital, all of them are caps. It is an abbreviation for Browning Automatic Rifle. So bar is going to be the word of the episode, but which bar is it? Should I pick a specific definition? Uh, was there one that sort of jumped out at me as being the most interesting? Um, maybe. No, I'm going to pick the fourth form of bar, which is a unit of pressure equal to 100,000 pascals, or pascals. I think it's pascals. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that if you celebrate Ash Wednesday and all the various holidays that you have a very good Ash Wednesday. I hope that um, that ash got put on your forehead very nicely and they didn't hurt you in any way. And uh, the next 40 days I hope for you are uh, great. I hope that whatever you give up, you you give up, you go you go full assed into it. You, you do it uh, all the way and... Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this podcast called The Dictionary, the only podcast in the world where some bunk a is reading the dictionary. My brain broke. Uh, the first word for this episode is the prefix bar, B-A-R, or baro, B-A-R-O. It is, like I said, it's a prefix. It means weight or pressure, as in barometer. This is from the Greek baros, which is akin to the Greek baris, B-A-R-Y-S, which means heavy. And there's more at the word grieve, like I am grieving in sadness. Next, we have barabbas, capital B-A-R-A-B-B-A-S. It is a noun from before the 12th century. A prisoner, according to Matthew, Mark, and John, released in preference to Christ at the demand of the multitude. Uh, this is Greek from Aram Baraba. Next we have Barathea. Uh, let's see, it is a noun from 1862, a fabric that has a broken rib weave and a pebbly texture and that is made of silk, worsted, or synthetic fiber or a combination of these. A lot of stuff that I don't know. What What is worsted? Some kind of fabric, I guess. Uh, let's see. It is from Baratheia, which is a trademark. Next, we have Barb. B-A-R-B. Is the sneeze coming? Maybe. No, it's going away. Okay. Uh, this is the first form of Barb. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, a medieval cloth headdress passing over or under the chin and covering the neck. Uh, very helpful when you're going into war. Uh, but it doesn't say that that's what it's for. Okay, number two, A, a sharp projection extending backward, as from the point of an arrow or fish hook, and preventing easy extraction. Also, a sharp projection with its point similarly oblique to something else. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but I think I actually have the point uh, or the barb of a fish hook in my finger still uh, from when I was very young. Uh, I don't remember it. I think I was too young and probably it was too traumatic. But yeah, my parents told me that when I was pretty little, I got a fish hook stuck in my finger. And um, I have this very faint sort of dark spot uh, in what, in one of my fingers. And I eventually realized that that might be what it's from. Um, let's see. Now we're on 2B. A biting or pointedly critical remark or comment. Number three. We just have the, uh, the the second form of the word barbell, uh, which uh, we'll get to probably in the next episode, I think. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, I got the sniffles again. See, this is what happens when I come in from the cold and I it's in the morning and I record, my nose gets all sniffly. Number four, any of the side branches of the shaft of a feather. And it says, see the feather illustration. Number five, a plant hair or bristle ending in a hook. Uh, let's see. This is from Middle English, barb with an E. It means barb or beard. Uh, that is from Latin barba, and there's more at the word beard. Number two, no, uh, the second form of barb is a transitive verb from 1759, and it means to furnish with a barb. But what kind of barb? Now we have the third form of barb. It is a noun from 1636. Any of a northern African breed of horses that are noted for speed and endurance. Uh, let's see, this is fr French, uh, from French barba, with an E, from Italian barbero, uh, which is also from barbero, which is of Barbary, that's with a capital B, which must be a location, probably in Italy, from Barbaria, or Barbaria, which is the Barbary, it's a coastal region in Africa. Oh yeah, they said it's an African breed, uh, so that's where Barbary is. Now we have the fourth form of barb. It is a noun from 1967, and it is a slang for barbiturate. Um, and I have an Aunt Barb. Hi, Barb. How you doing? Next we have barbarian. It is an adjective from the 14th century. One of or relating to a land, culture, or people alien and usually believed to be inferior to another land, culture, or people. Number two, lacking refinement, learning, or artistic or literary culture. Barbarian is a noun, and barbarianism is also a noun. This is from the Latin barbarus, and there's more at the word barbarous. Uh, now we have barbaric. It is an adjective from the 15th century. 1a, of, relating to, or characteristic of barbarians. 1b, possessing or characteristic of a cultural level more complex than primitive savagery, but less sophisticated than advanced civilization. 2a, marked by a lack of restraint. Synonym is wild. Th uh, 2b, having a bizarre, primitive, or unsophisticated quality. 3, we have the three definition of the word barbarous as a synonym. And bar Barbarically, is that how you say that word? Barbarically is an adverb. I barbarical. I th feel like I'm saying that wrong, but I might be right. Is this these coming back again? Oh man, it goes away. Okay, uh, let's see. Now we have barbarism. It is a noun from the 15th century. One a a barbarian or barbarous social or intellectual condition. Synonym is backwardness. One uh, b. The practice or display of barbarian acts, attitudes, or ideas. Two, an idea, act, or expression that in form or use offends against contemporary standards of good taste or acceptability. Now we have barbarity. It is a noun from circa 1570. One, we have the synonym barbarism. 2a, barbarous cruelty. Synonym is inhumanity. 2b, an act or instance of such cruelty. Next is barbarize. Uh, I hope you sense the pattern in this episode. Uh, this is a verb from 1602. First is uh, transitive definitions. To make barbarian or barbarous. Now we have the intransitive definition. To become barbarous. Uh, barbarization is a noun. And the last word, oh thank God my nose is going crazy. Uh, is barbarous, B-A-R-B-A-R-O-U-S. Big sniff. Um, see, I can't, I can't stop recording. Once I start, I can't stop. Uh, this is an adjective from the 15th century. 1A, synonym is uncivilized. 1B, lacking culture or refinement. Synonym is Philistine. 2, characterized by the occurrence of barbarisms, uh, as in barbarous language. Number 3, Mercilessly harsh or cruel, as in barbarous crimes. Synonym says, see the word fierce. I'm so fierce. Uh, barbarously is an adverb, and barbarousness is a noun. This is from Latin barbarous, which is from Greek barbaros, which means foreign or ignorant. Um, and 
the word of the episode is going to be... Uh, um, we'll pick Barabbas. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Thank you for joining me to this podcast called The Dictionary. I would like to wholeheartedly apologize for the last episode where my nose was running. As I said, I don't like to stop once I start recording. Uh, you know, I probably could have just uh, made a whole new take. Um, but uh, you know what? I was already well on my way, and I just wanted to chug, chug through it. So I chugged through it, and now I feel much better. Thank you for asking. Uh, so the first word for this episode is Barbary Ape, capital B-A-R-B-A-R-Y. Second word, A-P-E. <clears throat> this is a noun from 1791, a tailless monkey of northern Africa and Gibraltar, called also Barber- Barbary Macaque. Uh, the scientific name is Macaca sylvanus. Uh, it is from Barbary, Africa, which we learned uh, in the last episode. That's where Barbary is. Um, what is it? What did it say? It's the um, Barbary. It's a coastal region in Africa. All right. Next, we have Barbary sheep. It is a noun from circa 1898, and we just have the synonym Audad, and that is spelled because I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. A O U D A D. Uh, well, we must have read that before. I don't remember. I've read a lot of words. Uh, let's see. Next, we have barbecue. It is the first form. It's a verb from 1690. One, to roast or broil on a rack or revolving spit over or before a source of heat as hot coals. Number two, to cook in a highly seasoned vinegar sauce. Barbecuer is a noun. And it's, the etymology just says this is from the second form of barbecue, which I shall graciously read to you right now. It is a noun from 1709. Oh, that was weird. 1709. 1A, a large animal roasted whole or split over an open fire or a fire in a pit. Uh, and yes, that was split, not spit, because in the last one we said revolving spit. Uh, let's see, the large animal said could be a steer, as a steer. 1B, barbecued food, as in eat barbecue. Number two, a social gathering, especially in the open air, at which barbecued food is eaten. Number three, an often portable fireplace over which meat and fish are roasted. And I would just like to add on, it does not have to be meat or fish. Um, it can be many things, people, barbecue, veggies, and pineapple, and donuts. Have you ever had a barbecue donut? You put it on there for like five or ten seconds. I think I did it with donut holes, or, or actually somebody else did it. Ooh, it is good. All right. This is from the American Spanish word barbacoa. Oh, that's where it comes from, uh, which is a framework for supporting meat over a fire, and it is probably from a Taino word or from of the region Taino. I don't remember where, what that is. Um, I've heard of barbacoa. Um, that's a kind of meat. But I didn't realize that the actual word barbacoa is the framework for supporting the meat over the fire. And then we get the word barbecue from that. You learn something new every day, maybe. Next, we have the word barbed. It is an adjective from 1611. One having barbs. Number two, characterized by pointed and biting criticism or sarcasm, as in barbed witticisms. Next, we have barbed wire. It is a noun from 1866. Twisted wires armed with barbs or sharp points, called also barb wire, not barbed wire. Fun fact, though, barbed wire is two words and barb wire is one word. Next, we have barbel. Uh, yes, I think that is how it's pronounced. Uh, it is the first form, B-A-R-B-E-L. It is a noun from the 14th century. A European freshwater uh, cyprinid, cyprinid fish, that is spelled C-Y-P-R-I-N-I-D, with four barbels on its upper jaw. Also, any of various closely related fishes. 
this is from Latin barbalus, which is a diminutive of the Latin barbus, which means barbel, from barba, which means beard, and there's more at the word beard. So, of course, we've got to post a picture of this. Uh, the scientific name is barbus barbus. Uh, I'm going to have to tell my sister about that one. She would think it's funny. Uh, next, we have barbel again. It is the second form. It's a noun from 1601. A slender tactile process on the lips of certain fishes as catfishes. The, I guess it's barbel. I don't know. It sounds weird. But the next word we'll get to. Uh, yeah, I'll just go for it now. It is barbell. B-A-R-B-E-L-L. It is a noun from 1887. A bar with adjustable weighted discs at uh, attached to each end that is used for exercise and in weight lifting. Next, we have barber. Man, these words are starting to sound very weird. Uh, this is the first form. It is a noun. I lost my place. There we go. It is a noun from the 14th century. One whose business is cutting and dressing hair, shaving and trimming beards, and performing related services. This is Anglo-French, or from the Anglo-French barbour, which is from barbe, B-A-R-B-E, -B -A -R -B -E, which means beard, and there's more at the word barb. So that's where the word barber comes from. It comes from the word that means beard. Uh, so a true barber is one who only shaves and trims beards, and then somebody else would deal with the hair on the top of the head. Uh, in kindergarten, I had a teacher named Mr. Barber, and he was the nicest guy, great teacher. Uh, and then I actually had him again in third grade. He, What I found out later was that he wanted to teach all of the elementary school ages, which I, I think he ended up doing K through five, K through six, something like that. Uh, and so I just happened to uh, get him again as a teacher when he transitioned from kindergarten into third grade. And uh, he was still a very good teacher. Uh, what else do I got to say about the word barber? I can't think of it. Oh, I was going to say, I, uh, I used to buzz my hair for probably 20 years, 21 years. I would just buzz my hair and uh, I did it myself. And I ended up saving probably over, maybe I don't know, two or three thousand dollars um, by not going to the barber. Now we have the second form of barber. It is a verb from 1606. Uh, this is a transitive verb. The, the first one is to perform the services of a barber for trim or groom the hair or beard of. And now we have the intransitive definition to perform the services of a barber. Sorry, I still got the sniffles, but it's not as bad as the last episode. Next, we have barbary. It or, or is it no bar barberry? Is it barberry or barbary? I think it's barberry. B a r b e r r y. Uh, it is a noun from the 14th century. Any of a genus. Uh, where's the okay? Any of a genus of shrubs, usually having spines, usually yellow flowers, and oblong red or blackish berries. Yeah, it's definitely barberry. This is from Middle English, barbary, with an I-E, from Middle Latin, barbaris, which is from the Arabic, barbaris. Uh, the scientific name is berberis, or barbaris. It is of the family berberidicae, or berberidicae. Uh, that is of the barberry family. Next, we have barbershop. It is the first form. It's a noun from 1579. That word is a lot older than I expected. A barber's place of business. Now we have the second form of barbershop. It is an adjective from 1910. Of a style of unaccompanied group singing of popular songs usually marked by highly conventionalized close harmony. But why is it called barbershop? It is from the old custom of men in barbershops forming quartets for impromptu singing of sentimental songs. So the men would literally just sing in barbershops? I'm still not entirely sure why, uh, but yeah. And so interesting that they formed such close, tight harmonies. Uh, if you see some good barbershop singers, they are really amazing. Next, we have 
Barbet, B-A-R-B-E-T. It is a noun from 1824. Any of various often brightly colored non-passerine tropical f- uh, birds having a stout bill bearing bristles at the base. Oh, lots of B sounds. I'm not sure what non-passerine or passerine means. Uh, let's see. The family is uh, Capit- Capitonidae. Uh, that's one family. Another family is Libiidae. Oh, Jesus, this is ridiculous. And Megalimidae. I feel like such an idiot reading those. Uh, all right, now we have Barbet. B-E-T-T-E is at the end of the word. It is a noun from 1772. One, a mound of earth or a protected platform from which guns fire over a parapet. Number two, an armored structure protecting a gun turret on a warship. Uh, this is French, a diminutive of barbe, B-A-R-B-E, uh, which is a headdress. And that's uh, related, I think, to the first form of barb uh, from the last episode. Next, we have barbican. B-A-R-B-I-C-A-N. Thought you might want to know how it was spelled. This is a noun from the 13th century. An outer defensive work, especially a tower at a gate or bridge. Barbican. It is uh, from Anglo-French barbican from middle latin barbacana next we have barbicel b-a-r-b-i-c-e-l it is a noun from 1869 any of the small hook bearing processes on a barbule of a feather and see the feather illustration i don't know what a barbule is but i think i'm going to find out soon Next and last word for this episode is Barbie, B-A-R-B-I-E. It is a noun from 1976. Uh, It is chiefly Australian. One, we have the number two definition for barbecue. And number two, we have the three definition for the word barbecue. And the etymology just says by shortening and alternative or alternating something. Uh, so we started with that one and we ended with that one and, uh, we are going to pick barbershop as the word of the episode, uh, because I like barbershop quartet singing and I have sort of started to go to a barbershop to get my hair cut since I'm not buzzing it at the moment. And I also didn't know that the word barber came from the word beard. That is it for this episode. Uh, Let's see. What are some things? Oh, my wife and I recently... You can turn me off if you don't want to hear this stuff. Uh, My wife and I recently watched a couple movies. We watched VFW, which is a new movie. It's sort of a... I guess you could call it a horror movie, but it's kind of a comedy. And it's not totally horror. It's more of a... Man, I don't even know what you'd call it. Anyway, it's kind of a ridiculous, fun action murdery bloody movie not for kids that's for sure uh we also watched the warriors from 1979 uh i had seen it a long time ago but i didn't really remember it that well she had never seen it um it's also kind of ridiculous uh it's definitely dated it's a weird concept i don't know it's kind of fun but it's also kind of lame i don't know i have to think about it what else i think that's all i got to say Uh, Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye.